Okay. Hey, Light Church. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Benji. I uh, wanted just to welcome you, especially if you're new to tuning in. A couple of things we want you to know about and one really exciting announcement. Uh, first, uh, head to our website, lightsandiego.com. Drop us a note. Let us know who you are so we can stay in contact with you. Uh, we have a worship night coming up at the beginning of March. We want you guys to just know about. Also, we just launched Open Tables, which is our smaller groups that meet throughout the week. And we'd love for you guys to join those. But also wanted to give you this really cool update. In December, we focused on raising money for Malawi and specifically an orphanage that we're partnering there, as well as the Mwanda Project. Uh, that's a school in Uganda that um, Michelle Jew helped develop. And this past week, Jen and I had the privilege of going to Malawi for the first time to visit uh, Good Samaritan's Children's Home, this beautiful orphanage with over 200 kids. I just wanted to share a little bit about your generosity and some of the impact that it had. Uh, first and foremost, Malawi is a beautiful country. It's nicknamed the Warm Heart of Africa, and it lived up to its reputation to some of the most warm-hearted people I've ever met. And while we were there spending time at this home, came to realize that there are 1.2 million orphans in Malawi. And we, as a church, feel a call uh, to lean in specifically to help alleviate that, that level of brokenness in our world because Jesus says in his scriptures, the pure and undefiled religion is to look after the orphan and the widow in their distress. And so a few ways that we're doing that. Number one is we want to do preventative measures. And we're doing this by helping with uh, Open Road Global, which is a nonprofit that's a part of our church, to develop a community center that's going to help people who are just trapped in extreme poverty be able to have ways out. And through that education and livelihood development, it's going to help prevent uh, situations that could help lead towards orphanhood. Secondly, Good Samaritan Children's Home is this beautiful place, and there are 90 caregivers that are living there, uh, serving over 200 orphans. And while we were there, uh, we were able to take some of the money that was raised, and we were able to give every single worker $20, in, in about $20 in American, like, USD uh, standard. But for them, that was almost a month's worth of salary. And so we got to walk around with envelopes to all 90 workers and to be able to give them because of your generosity, something that for them literally changed their life. Um, these people, and not only did they live paycheck to paycheck, but essentially they, when they get paid, they probably don't have enough to give them the food to get to the next paycheck. And so when they receive this, I wanted to show you a video clip of just one of the rooms that we got to be in um, and when we got to pass them this and just their level of joy and celebration. It was too good not to share with you guys. And so let's watch this short clip um, and I'll share a few more thoughts. Um, that that moment was uh, unbelievable. Um, one that I'll never forget. And I've videoed every single room, and every single room, without fail, erupted into singing and dancing because of what they received. And I just I felt so um, challenged uh, in terms of the level of joy and gratitude I have in my heart, um, but also. Uh, we were talking with someone there, and he was saying, you know, in America, uh, you, you say you trust God, but really, you have so many layers of things that you can trust before you trust God. If you run out of money, you can call the bank, or you can get a loan, you can 
uh, have a, a government agency help you, you can call family. He says, in Malawi, we don't have any other backup other than God. All we have is trust. And then he looked at us, he says, but God always comes through. And I was just so convicted at just the layers of, of opportunities we have before we need to trust God. doesn't mean we don't want to trust God. It just means that there's so many other options that we can trust before saying, Lord, you have to show up. Uh, but just that last look in his face, he says, God always shows up. It was such a beautiful reminder. And I just want to encourage you. Number one, if, you, if you're giving here, I mean, it's amazing seeing what God is doing through this. But also know that you're, you're giving. The reason we do this is for the sake of us making sure that we aren't relying on other means, strategy, employers, things to be our source of trust. Um, and I was just really reminded of that, even being in a church service there and watching people bring their tithes and offering up to the front. Um, and while they're doing it, again, singing and dancing. These are people facing their second year of famine. And um, so just want to say thank you. Thank you for pouring in to the care of the orphan and the widow. And um, yeah, let's get our hearts ready as we worship the Lord together. There is none like you. No one else could touch my heart like you do. I can save for all eternity long and find there is none like you. 
We are on commandment number nine. Can you believe it? We have one more week left to finish the Ten Commandments. And this week we're talking about not uh, having false testimony against a neighbor. And this comes from verse 16, which says, literally, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And the idea uh, behind this is that like every, every commandment that God has given up to this point is he is instructing the Israelites what it means to be this new free society that's no longer under the oppression of Egyptian rule. And he's letting them know how to conduct relationship with Yahweh, which is the first four commandments, and then relationship with each other, which is the last six. And this context here of you shall not bear false witness uh, has tremendous significance in terms of what does it mean to be a healthy, free society. And so I want to just kind of look at four different perspectives on the significance of this commandment of why does God want us to move us from people being false witness or untruth into being people of truth and grace. Number one is that truth creates health within society. Number two, truth protects relationships. Number three, truth reflects the nature of Jesus. And fourthly, truth reveals if we are living in love. So the first one, uh, and really the context for this commandment, is that truth creates health within our society. At the end of World War II, Elton True Blood, who is a prolific Quaker philosopher and theologian, wrote a book on the Ten Commandments entitled Foundations for Reconstruction. The idea behind True Blood's uh, work is that he was looking at a world that needed to be reconstructed after World War II, and he leaned on the Ten Commandments as the foundation into which we were to do that. And he does this because Israel needed reconstruction. They needed to learn how to be a people. And the context of the ninth commandment is first and foremost um, civil. It's, it's a courtroom language. And when Israel began to establish their judicial system, they put some things in place that would help ensure that there was fairness and equity and justice in terms of people giving witness and people bringing things to Moses and then eventually other judges. The first layer of this, to make sure this was done in a healthy and right way, is that there was a stipulation that a person's testimony had to be confirmed by two or three other witnesses, meaning you can't just go and blame someone. It had to be two or three other witnesses had to see it. Similar to us, an eyewitness is a significant um, element in terms of a court of law. But the second safeguard is interesting. If a witness is proved false, meaning you lied, um, in the process of trying to make your case, the witness is to receive the punishment he or she wanted for the person he or she lied about. So if you're trying to get someone in trouble and you're making false accusations and they found that out, whatever punishment you wanted for that person you were accusing would then be given to you. And the third safeguard was even heavier is that if you were bearing false witness and you wanted something done to that person, that you actually had to be the person who did it. And so there's all these different things that God in his wisdom is instructing. This is how you are to be a um, society. Three chapters later, in Exodus 23, it reads, Do not spread false reports. Do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. And when you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. Do not show favoritism to a poor person in lawsuits. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. If you see the donkey or someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help them with it. Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with the false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death or I will not acquit the guilty. Do not accept a bribe for a bribe blinds those who see and twists the words of the innocent. Do not oppress a foreigner. You yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners because you were foreigners in Egypt. Later on in Leviticus, it writes, you shall not lie to one another. And then later on still, you shall not go about being a slander. God seems very bent on making a fair and just 
society based around truth. Charles Sweezy, who's the professor of ethics at Union Theological Seminary, wrote, truth is a precondition for order in society. Life is not possible without a minimal trust in the veracity of words. The institutionalization of this practice is a social condition for the survival of society. Or, as John Stott puts it, to lie is to begin, begin playing the devil's game, and we will never beat the devil at his own game. I remember um, take your son or take your child to work day and growing up, I would go downtown because my dad was a lawyer. And we'd go to the courtroom and we would uh, just kind of play kind of mock trials and things like this. And, and I remember this idea of, uh, you know, swearing on the Bible um, and, and saying, you know, do you promise to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Uh, so help you God, or something of that. And, then, and as I thought back of it, I reached out to my dad. I'm like, do people swear on the Bible? Do you know, do people swear an oath? And he says, no, there's, there's no Bible. It's used in courtrooms, at least anymore. He um, says, interestingly enough, that some people actually don't want to swear because of their conviction in the Bible, how Jesus in Matthew 5.37 says, all you need is to say simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So they actually have now built in language that says, do you swear or affirm uh, the truth? But even within our um, modern contemporary society, there is this idea that we cannot have justice and equity without truth. And that's really of our first layer is we need this. But like all of the commandments, this wasn't just for civil significance, all of this points back to relationships. The reason why we do not bear false witness is because when you slander and you don't speak the truth and you create falsehood around your neighbor, it breaks relationships, which is at the forefront of what God is trying to restore. The author of Proverbs puts this aptly when he says, Like a club and a sword on a sharp arrow is a man who bears false witness against his neighbor. Or in Proverbs 11, it says, With their mouths the godless destroy their neighbor. Martin Luther in his larger catechism book wrote this, It is a common evil plague that everyone prefers hearing evil to learning good from his neighbor. And although we ourselves are so bad that we cannot suffer that anyone should say anything bad about us, but everyone would much rather than all the world should speak of him in golden terms, yet we cannot bear that the best is spoken about others. There's this thing in us that leans towards self-preservation. And it's not something that shows up later on in life at a very early age. I watch it with my kids. Like when I go and I see two of my kids doing something they shouldn't, immediately fingers come out and they're pointing to one another. I remember when I was growing up and uh, my older brother and I were, I think we were bored. And so I convinced him like, hey, let's hide in the bushes. And when a rock, or sorry, when a car drives by our street, let's throw rocks at it. Now my brother's older and wiser than me, still is. Uh, and he's like, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm like, no, we're totally fine. He's like, all right. So I convinced him. We go hide in the bushes, and we wait. And we lived in kind of this quiet street, and all of a sudden this car comes down, and we both have a rock. I'm like, okay, one, two, three, and we both threw, except for I didn't let go of my rock, and he did, and the rock hit the car. The car immediately stopped. We looked at each other, jetted inside, and then all of a sudden we hear a knock at the door, and the person comes in, and and my, my mom opens the door and the person says, one of your kids just threw a rock in my car. And she looks at us and says, who did it? And immediately I, I looked at my brother and I'm like, well, he threw the rock. And my brother was obviously furious because I was the one who had the idea. I was the one who fake threw it. And he was the one who fully got the consequence for it. And there is, there's something within us that we want to point that finger. And I think, I think although bearing false witness definitely has, um, 
context around the court. I think that there's areas in our lives that we do this all the time. Number one, when we, when we participate or when we start rumors, when we entertain and maybe initiate gossip, when we exaggerate the truth, when we lean into a white lie, when we leave out details or try and soften the truth, and maybe even before that, it's maybe just assuming the worst of someone, creating a false narrative in your head that's not even true. And maybe you haven't borne false witness, but in your heart you already have. You haven't given them what Will um, Guidara says is the charitable assumption. And so I just want to pause right here. And before we're like, oh, yeah, Ninth Commandment, cool. This is like, got it. When I'm in the court next time, I won't do this. And I want us to take a look and just, for us to take an honest evaluation of our heart and our words. How do we talk about other people, specifically people who we feel have wronged us, people who are difficult to love, people who've hurt us? Um, do we use it under the umbrella of, I'm just venting, or they had it coming, or hey, I'm just speaking the truth? And, and I think that there's something that we need to be, pay attention to in order for us to live as the people of God, we have to watch the narratives we spread about the people around us. And my guess is if you're watching this, you have personally been hurt by people saying false things about you. I mean, it's devastating to have your reputation marred when you didn't do what people thought you did. Now, there's a level of comfort that I have that if there's anyone who understands that pain, it's Jesus. Daryl Johnson in his book says that Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh to the rescue, experienced people bearing false witness against him through the whole of his earthly life. False things were said about the circumstances of his conception and birth. False things were said about his character. False rumors were spread about what he said in his sermons. And it all culminated in his trial where the court listened to no one but false witnesses. I mean, I, one of the most painful seasons of my life was when um, a handful of people, um, really a couple of people, uh, started making accusations about things that were not true of me. And I, I battled with um, that pain of rejection and betrayal and um, just the weight of what that meant to me. And I'm sure that, again, like if you're watching this, you probably felt that. And it's important for us to look at the pain we've felt and to be able to adjust our hearts and say, Lord, would you help me never do that? And I think this leads to our third point that the reason why the truth is so important is because it reflects the very nature of Jesus. John 1.17 says that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. When we speak grace and truth, we are aligning ourselves with the one we say we follow. Again, Johnson writes, grace and truth. For Jesus, it is never just truth. It is always truth and grace, grace and truth. Truth without grace can become oppressive legalism. Grace without truth can become sentimental relativism. Like Jesus, we need to stand not with one foot in grace and one foot in truth, but with both feet in grace and both feet in truth. Meaning, if you are, a, let's call it a grace person, um, then you probably need to make sure you're leaning into truth and not bending the truth, saying white lies, uh, leaving out details, um, not sharing important details with your spouse or your accountability group or with your friends and, and you're wanting to always say the right things. You're walking on eggshells and tiptoeing. Like if, if, if you're a grace person, you have to live under the conviction that you need to speak words that are true. On the other hand, if you're a truth person and you know who you are, you're the person who likes to say how it is. You're less concerned about people's feelings. You are, not that you don't care about people, but you care, you believe that it's the truth that it's going to actually help them. 
that you need to realize that every time Jesus spoke the truth, it was wrapped in grace. You need to lean into that. And by doing that, according to 1 John, it says that when we walk in the light as God is in light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all of our sin. Which brings up an important question. Is is there ever a time to not tell the truth? Is there ever a time when bearing a false witness um, is, I'm not talking about in the courts, but just in general, is it ever good? And I think the answer to that, if I'm being honest, is yes, but it's very rare. Think about Rahab, who was commended multiple times in Scripture because she hid the spies and she did not speak the truth. Think about in a more modern context, Corey Tim Boom, who hid Jews during Nazi Germany and by doing that, saving people's lives. And I think the only time that it would be appropriate to not speak the truth and to bear false witness is that by speaking the truth breaks the great commandment of not, of, I'm sorry, breaks the commandment of loving your neighbor. So if by sharing the truth, you are harming um, your neighbor, you are putting them in jeopardy, their life in jeopardy, then at that point, loving your neighbor always needs to be the lens in which you filter all the commandments through. But again, that'll be very rare. You see, our ability to live into truth is also a good barometer in terms of the condition of our own security in Christ. And what I mean by that is the truth reveals something about us. You see, when we bear false witness, when we speak untruth to a neighbor that we are called to, it's revealing something deep within us rather than the subject of our slander. There's something in us. When we spread false rumors, when we slander, when we, spot, when we speak negatively about someone else, when we do that, there's something inside of us that's revealing a level of insecurity and revealing a level of pain within us that we need to make sure that we address. Because when we don't do that, when we're not aware of the pain that's inside us, we will begin to doing protective mechanisms and different things to make sure that, two, one, we're protected, but also in our protection, we'll probably be putting other people down. And so the reason why truth is important because it also reveals a level of security that we have within Jesus. This is why I think it says in Scripture, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. How do we do this? How do we make sure that we are secure enough in God's love that we don't have to slander other people or we don't have to um, not speak the truth? John Stotts puts it well. He says, we live in and out of a truthful center by consciously living every moment in the presence of Jesus, the faithful and true witness. But just revisiting what, what happens when there are things being spoken about us that are not true? What happens when there are things inside of us that feel like are being attacked? And again, I've, I've literally had this happen to me. And one of the verses that brought me tremendous comfort was Psalm 25, 21. It says this, May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope, Lord, is in you. One translation says, May integrity be a shield around me. And I just want to say, if, if people right now in your workplace, in your family, are saying things about you, they're tearing you down and destroying your reputation, my prayer for you isn't that you get back at them, isn't that you feel like you have to go and even undo everything, you had, or everything they've said. Know this, your integrity is a shield around you. Live rightly. And by doing that, eventually the truth will prevail. It's almost like gossip and slander and false witness are these, are these explosive moments, but they have no stamina. They don't have the ongoing logs that continue to feed the fire. Yet integrity and truthfulness and righteousness always wins out. We must not live underneath the breaking pressure of people's words and perceptions about us. Thomas Merton, in his book, The Seven Story Mountain, wrote this. The logic of the world rests on the strange error that our perfection depends on the thoughts and opinions and applause of other men. A weird life it is indeed to be living always in somebody else's imagination 
as if that were the only place in which one could at last become real. So in conclusion, the ninth commandment, the reason why it is so important, if you hear one thing when you hear this, the reason why it is important not to bear false witness is because it speaks to God's character. And if God's character is truth, then the character of the enemy is untruth. This is why Jesus, in John chapter 8, speaks about Satan being the father of lies. In addressing the Pharisees, he said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. But I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies, yet because I tell the truth. I mean, think about the significance of this verse. Satan is the father of lies. When he lies, he speaks his native language, which means when we lie, when we don't speak truth and love, we are aligning ourselves with someone who is not supposed to be our father. We're not supposed to look like we're a part of his family, which is why Jesus, on the other hand, where Satan is the father of lies, one of the primary themes we see about Jesus' life is that where the enemy is an accuser, Jesus is an advocate. He's an intercessor. Romans 8.34 talks about is he's at the right hand of God interceding for us. And Hebrews 7.25 um, says he always lives to intercede for us. And 1 John 2, listen to this, is my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. I want you to pay attention to this. is so important. The reason we should not lie and bear false witness is because it aligns ourselves with the nature and character of the devil. But when we look at the nature and the character of Jesus, he's an advocate for the truth. Now, if Jesus is an advocate before his father day and night, and you start being like, well, if Jesus can't lie, then isn't that a little bit alarming? Because if Jesus cannot lie before the father, what is he saying about me? He knows my every thought. He knows my words. He knows my motivations. He knows my interior life. And if he cannot bend the truth, if he cannot soften it, if he cannot uh, turn a blind eye, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. What does that mean? What is he advocating for? And the beautiful thing about the gospel is this, is that because of what Jesus has done, you are now, in Paul's language, hidden in him. So when Jesus advocates for you, the truest thing about you is not your own unrighteousness or self-righteousness, the truest thing about you, if you are hidden in Christ, is His righteousness. So when you live outside of that world, when you live into slander, when you break one of the Ten Commandments, it is Jesus' job as an advocate to remind the Father of the truth that you now exist in Him. This is the beautiful good news of the Gospel, where, this, where Satan lives to be our accuser, he's accusing us, he's accusing our own conscience of, see, you'll never be good enough, look what you've done, this is who you are. Jesus says, no, this is not who you are. Yes, this is what you have done, but who you are is adopted, who you are is mine, what you have is my righteousness, what you look like is spotless before my Father. And this is why the incredible news is not only is Jesus the truth, not only is he a truth teller, but the truth that he's telling is washed in the gospel. It's washed in his sacrifice. And so if you're watching this, know that in the courtroom, before the heavenly father, there's an accuser and an advocate. 
The accuser will always point out what you've done wrong. But the advocate will always point out what's been done for you. The righteousness, not according to your works or what you've done, but the righteousness according to the selfless sacrifice of Jesus' blood on the cross. And because of that, he's always lived to make intercession for us. So as his children, would we live into that truth? And would we become agents of truth? And this is why it's important that when we speak truth, we speak grace and truth. Because the advocate is not only speaking truth, he's speaking that truth wrapped in the grace of his cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are advocating for us right now. Jesus, you are standing before your Father, interceding for us, not according to our works, merit, what we've earned, but because of what you've done. And Jesus, I'm asking that if someone doesn't know that and has not found themselves hidden in Christ, I pray they would today. Lord, I pray that you'd silence the voice of the accuser. Lord, I pray that you take the lies and the slander, whether it's from the enemy, whether it's from people in our lives, and I pray you'd shut that mouth and quiet that voice and that you'd bring about truth, Lord. We love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen.